I'm so happy to see so many people from the philanthropic community here, Dr. Gale, D Dave Hiller, so many people, Tawa Mitchell is here, um, but I'm also so happy to see so many people from the corporate community, Mesro, Comet, I don't want to start calling names because I'll miss someone, but it is so important because this topic is so, so important and relevant and prevalent. There is nothing more important given the couple of elections that we got. You know, we got some exciting stuff going on in the next few weeks. Um, this is a topic that not only do we need to talk about, but we need to talk about, and as Father has said many times before, take action on. So you guys ready? Yep. Great, great. Um, I don't need to introduce these folks. Everybody knows Superintendent Johnson, Mary Mitchell, and Father Flegger. So why don't you guys come on up? Oh, shoot. I don't want to ask Joe Dominguez because I haven't actually introduced myself yet. But uh, Mr. Hiller, could you hand me my phone? That was rather forward of me, wasn't it? Lots of jewels. <laughs> it's called bling, Dave. <laughs> Um, the reason I'm having my phone is because these folk um, have a lot of insight and a lot of information to share, and I have to keep them on a schedule. It's gonna be Melissa, hard. let's see how this works, because I don't know. Um, we're going to start right in with a very, very short introduction. Superintendent Johnson, you get to go first. Okay. So it's since we're on a tight schedule, I will kind of forgo some of the things that I was going to talk about. But <laughs> first and foremost, though, I'd like to thank uh, Mary Emanuel for having the foresight to give me the opportunity to even become police superintendent. Uh, we didn't really know each other when, when he approached me about taking the job. But what he knew about me was that I love the city of Chicago and um, the Chicago Police Department. So I'll be eternally grateful for him for giving me this opportunity, and I'm still humbled to this day to be police superintendent. Um, whether you're a police officer on the front lines or fighting violence or, or a prosecutor in the courtroom fighting for the defenseless or a courageous member of a community who stands up against the gang culture that preys on our neighborhoods, none of us can do this alone. And we all need each other if we're going to continue the progress of reducing crime and violence in our city. And I also want to acknowledge and thank Father Flager for being a true friend and mentor to me. When I was an officer and commander in the 6th District, Father Mike was there bridging the gaps even back then in the community and advocating for those without a voice. I also want to acknowledge Mary Mitchell for being a sounding board for me and calling balls and strikes in her reporting. Mary will often call me on issues that impact our community and she works very hard to be fair and be on the side of what's right. And at the end of the day, that's the side we all should stand on. Now let me be crystal clear. We have a tremendous amount of work to do in Chicago. And we're not satisfied with the current state of affairs and violence affecting our city. The level of gun violence in our neighborhoods is unacceptable. The ability of, a crim of the criminal justice system to hold repeat offenders accountable is marginal at best. And we owe a lot more to the citizens of this city to make their neighborhoods safer and stronger. However, I will share with you the progress that's being made and let you know that we are headed in the right direction. What I can tell you with absolute certainty is your police officers are among the most dedicated in this country despite a national climate that can be viewed as antagonistic. These men and women go about there every day and are willing to back up the quality of their service with their lives. Today, I'm going to ask you to remember the number 941, 941. That's how many fewer victims of gun violence there have been since we implemented a community-driven crime strategy that focuses on building stronger trust in the communities and using data and technology to fight crime smarter. 142 more individuals are alive today because of the reductions made in murders. That's a 20% reduction since 2016. Also since that time, and listen to this, 13,749, 13,749 illegal guns have been taken off the streets of Chicago. <laughs> Any one of those weapons could have ended up being used in a deadly encounter, encounter with citizens or police officers. 
In a few days, we're going to conclude the third quarter of the year, mm -hmm. and so far, those incremental reductions in violence continue as murders are again reduced by 20% this year. Mm -hmm. That's 100 more people that are alive today. And the overall number of shootings is down by more than 500 since January 1st. That's a 17% reduction citywide. 30 seconds. Now, none of this is cause for celebration because the level of gun violence is still unacceptable, but it's a call for further action, further investment in our strategies and tactics, and that we are working to go in the right direction. So with that, I will end just by saying that the partnerships between the police and the community is so vitally important for reducing gun violence. We're making progress, but we're not there yet. But I think if we stand together as a city, we will see gun violence reduced even more as we head into the year 2019. Thank you all. Thank you, Chief. <laughs> Ms. Mitchell. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you for those kind words. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm here today speaking to you as a citizen not as a newspaper writer and not as a columnist, but as someone who grew up in Chicago, public housing, lived and started, my family started off on the west side of the city. We moved to the south side, lived in Dearborn Homes for until I was about 12 years old, moved to the Clarence Darrow Homes, and finally to Auburn Gresham. My family finally was able to buy a house in Auburn Gresham. I'll tell you that because I speak today on behalf of citizens. I live in South Shore. I live in a neighborhood where I can come home at any day and find yellow tape in someone's driveway because someone has been shot. Someone has been killed on the very block that I live on. It means that when I go out and I walk my dog daily, I have to worry about a drive-by. Not somebody want to drive by and shoot me. Maybe that might happen. Maybe that might be what somebody would have an attention somebody would want to do. But the young men across the street, there's three or four of them walking together. And I got to think, when I take my path, do I want to walk past them because somebody might be trying to get them? I can't let my granddaughter ride a bike in our neighborhood. I can't go and sit on the lakefront late at night like other people do, or early in the morning, because it's not safe. That's what we're dealing with. And so when I think about Chicago, I think about the beauty that it has. I think about the architecture. I think about the lakefront. I think about our bustling downtown. But I also think about our problems. And the biggest problem that we have is not the numbers. The numbers. Uh, Superintendent Johnson just told you there is a reduction. They get, they're taking the guns off the street, but the perception is still there. When I pick up my newspaper now and there is a shooting, that shooting no longer is on the front page. Anybody ever thought about that? No matter how uh, 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 horrible it is, we don't put it on the front page anymore. We have let it be like, oh, let's, push, let's push this in the background. Let's push this on page 14 or page 15. And maybe people won't be as scared. But you know what? It needs to be on the front page. Life is that precious. And when we lose one young person in this city, it should affect all of us. Right. So for me, for me, even though uh, there has been a reduction in crime, we got to do something about the perception. We have to do something about uh, how we see crime in this city. It's not OK that our young people are dying. We should all be sad about that. This week, on Monday, I lost my 91-year-old mother. She died. She died having lived a full life. Right. She died with me seeing her go back to childhood, for her, me having the opportunity to take care of my mother. But think about all these Chicagoans who don't have that opportunity because their kid got killed at 16 or 15 or 14. To read in our paper, that two kids got killed just yesterday outside of the L station is appalling to me. 30 seconds. We should all be upset about that. So, the, so I think that what we have to do is be very honest about what's causing this. And it's not all about guns on the street. It's not all about somebody not having a job. 
It's not all about, you know, uh, the fact that we have a, a, a busing downtown and a sad uh, uh, south side or west side. It's about what's going on in our homes. Yep. How do we help? How do we help save families so that we can save these children? Thank you. Before I ask um, Father to speak, um, I, I know we acknowledge the philanthropic community and the corporate community. How many clergy do we have in the house? We have no preachers? <laughs> you too. Okay. That is, that's the third leg of the stool. Um, you know, I, I think that those of us who come from a church background understand that that's where our rooting and our grounding is. Um, it is so important that you are here, so I want to make sure that we acknowledge you. Um, thank you for being here as well. Um, Stephanie Trussell from WLS is here. We missed you. Where are you, Stephanie? Hi, Stephanie. Keep your questions coming, and Father Flager. All right. <laughs> Um, the, the whole title, Perception Reality, I am very grateful and thankful to the superintendent and to the law enforcement for the numbers being down. Thank God they're decreasing for so long where they've been increasing, so I appreciate that. But if we look beyond numbers, we must also have a different answer. If we ask the mothers and fathers or children if they feel safe in the south and west sides, the answer is no. If we ask seniors, the one who told me who lives in the 76th Street complex, she gets in every day at five o'clock, locks up the front of her house, and sits in the back of her house because she's afraid to sit in her living room because of a bullet coming through the window. If we ask the, as Mary just mentioned, uh, the young br brother from De La Salle, one of my students who texts me yesterday said we're in lockdown, or the freshman in De La Salle who came into my office yesterday afternoon shaking and crying because she witnessed the murder of those two young men and has five bullets in the, her uncle's car while they were sitting at the stoplight on LaSalle, they don't feel safe. We speak to young people in high schools or grammar schools that they feel safe going to and from school. Safe passage is good, but they still feel unsafe. If we ask the business owner if his customers feel safe, the answer is no. Uh, this past September, we had our annual Renaissance Festival at St. Sabine on 79th Street from Loomis until Racine. Three weeks before the festival, the people from out of town who do the Ferris wheel said, we're canceling out, we're sending back the check because we're afraid of our workers coming into the city of Chicago and putting up the Ferris wheel where they've had no problems for seven years. The perception is real. So while statistics are down, perception is up. The truth is we have whole communities in Chicago who are suffering from post-traumatic stress, but I call it present traumatic stress. But I want to be clear, I love and respect Superintendent Johnson. I know there's people out here that wanted him to resign. He is the best thing we got right now in Chicago Police Department. Woo! And I will support him. And I will support him and loved him since I think it was Beat 621. That's it, 621. <laughs> when he was a beat cop in 6th District and a wonderful commander. I stand with him 100%. But I have to also say he has a nearly impossible job. He has to deal with a culture in CPD that has been developed for decades, that a consent degree is not necessarily going to change. Some are just going to have to be retired out before things change. Systems that allow a bad cop to squeeze through and even get promoted, e.g. John Burge. An FOP contract that makes it nearly impossible to weed out bad cops. And the present FOP that consistently fights any kind of reform, the day a consent reform is put out, is condemned as something horrible and terrible for the Chicago Police Department, is said in the same day. A mentality that if you want to remove a bad cop, that does not mean that you're against all cops. You just want a bad cop gone so the good cops are protected and safe. <laughs> lastly, <laughs> lastly, we must deal with the other kind of crimes in Chicago that has nothing to do with police. The crime of un high unemployment, the crime of underfunded and underperforming schools, 
the crime of coming back from incarceration, Cook County being one of the largest in the nation that has people in incarceration coming back with nothing to do and no opportunities. The crime of poverty and racism and sexism. The crime of lack of economic development and the lack of resources. All that fuels a climate of hopelessness and despair in the tale of two cities and a crime of a breakdown of values in our society today that is not black values, white values, brown values. It starts from the President of the United States all the way down to the, the lowest level of society of poverty. We are a valueless society today and they we're all part of it and we're all seeing the results of it. There's a perception that these crimes are unfortunately are statistical realities, but they are the real. And one thing, last thing I'll say is this, well, I always go to these panels, and oftentimes Superintendent Johnson and I are on panels together talking about the city and talking about safety and silence. But I want to know this. We need to expand these panels. Instead of just community and police, we need to have corporate America sitting on the panels. Absolutely. It's a very failed responsibility. We need developers on the panels to see what they ought to do to help communities. We need city planners on the, commun on the panels to say what they're going to do to help change the city. So now that I've insulted all of you, thank you. <laughs> Did you all catch how I had no problem telling Superintendent Johnson? 30 seconds. Yeah. But I was like, ooh. <laughs> Father Flager, 30 seconds. I know a little bit about daring to interrupt, interrupt preachers. Whew. I need it. I can't believe I did that. Um, so we've got lots of questions, and we're going to get right into them. In all fairness, Father Flegger, we did have someone from the corporate community. When, you know, this is the second. This is part two that we did uh, not a little uh, less than a year ago. But we did have someone from the corporate community speak as well. Um, and I'm so glad again that we all we're all here. Um, we're listening, and it matters to us. Um, it certainly matters to all of us in the corporate community as well. So we'll dive right in. So first is from anonymous. <laughs> That's always a bad thing. It's a bad sign. It's a bad sign. Bad sign. I know that that laughter wasn't like the laughter at the United Nations the other day. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's these meds I'm on, you guys. Father Flager, would you ever consider running for mayor? <laughs> if not, I'm not done yet. Who? do you think would be tough enough on crime and be what we need in the mayor office? I'll give you two minutes for it. If you think I'm answering that question, <laughs> somebody's put some cocaine in the food in here. No, absolutely not. I'm not interested. And I say, let's wait a couple of weeks and the dust settles to see who's really running. But let me tell you what's important to me. I don't care about the race, the ethnic group, the gender, the age, the background. I want to know what are their priorities, what are their policies, how are they going to change Chicago, right. particularly in the south and west side. That's what defines a mayoral candidate to me. That's right. Okay. Some of these questions are um, softballs, but there are some very serious questions in here as well. Um, this is one of them. Um, from a member of the corporate community, you just were talking about that. Um, I'm going to direct this to Superintendent Johnson. What can the citizens and the corporate citizens of Chicago do to make violence provision a top priority for safety for the next mayor? So I'll take the corporate section first. And Father Mike hit on it. Crime is a complex issue. There's not just one single cause for right. crime. Marion and, and, and Father Mike actually hit on two important pieces of it. So with the corporate, with corporate Chicago, Listen, we have a lot of guys out there. You know, I, I've told you all, the drivers of the violent crime is a small subsection of this city. We got 2.7 million people in this city. We're talking about roughly 1,400 guys that are really driving the violent crime. Let me tell you something about the gang world. A lot of guys in that world want to get out. They just don't know yeah. how and they don't have the resources to point them in the right directions. But one of the main things that they will tell you, I tell you, when I was a commander of the 6th District, I helped a young guy over there that had done about four years in prison get a job in the community. The look on that dude's face when he got that first paycheck to take it home to his girl and his little baby was priceless. A lot of these guys just need an opportunity. So in corporate Chicago, if you can just help us with, with committing 
to take on one or two of these guys. We got enough businesses in this city where we can get this done. That gang lifestyle will go down dramatically. Now, in terms of the community, what the community can do is this, and Mary hit on it. It's not just about what the police do. It's not just about better education and better jobs. Listen, we had a shooting, a tragic incident just yesterday where two 16-year-olds' lives were taken from them. They didn't give it up. It was taken from them. And the offenders to these crimes, are, we can assume, are fairly young also, right? Those offenders with, to that crime took those guns and went into somebody's house to go to bed right. last night. Now you answer this. I don't know any 16 year olds that own their own home or renting their own apartment. I don't know anybody yeah, like yeah. that. So the point is this. The parents or the custodial people in those households, we have to take responsibility for our own households. We take responsibility for our households, then we take responsibility for that block and then that neighborhood, and then that community, and eventually this city. So don't place all the blame. It's not about pointing fingers and placing blame. It's about being accountable and accepting your role and responsibility in making this city safer. To that end, did Mary, did you want to say something? I guess I struggle, I struggle with the fact that when we talk about what's going on in community, we often uh, kind of link poverty with crime. Because a person is poor, they're out here doing X, Y, Z. That's not always the case. I grew up in public housing. I grew up in one of the, one of the most populated, concentrated pockets of poverty in this city. And everybody knew who the bad kids were. Everybody knew where they could go out and hang out and do whatever they want to, whose house they could go to and, and do underage drinking or all the other things. Everybody knew that. But we had a, in, within that public housing complex, we had a culture where if somebody knew something bad was going on, they came and told your mama. And by the time you got to your house, you not only, your mom not only know what you did, who you did it with, all of that. We got to get back to, in, these in our communities, we got to get back to a basic thing, neighborhood. Yeah. That's right. we, gotta get, we gotta become good neighbors. We have to care about not just my child, I gotta care about my neighbor's child. And until we do, if we don't do that, then what we're doing is allowing the gangs and the, and the, and the people who are up to no good to raise our kids for us. They're doing, they're, the ones influencing our children. We're not uh, playing a role in how they develop. And I think that's what we have to get back to. We have to get back to actually caring about the people who live near us and around us. Thank you both. Um, to, you can certainly clap. To that end, um, with the, on, the, on, the, on the community side, I will say again to the church community, I almost feared getting in trouble at church as much as I feared getting in trouble at home. Um, because everybody could get you at church. So again, it's just the truth. Somebody can say amen, really you can. Um, and on the corporate side, um, with respect to uh, giving folks jobs, there are a number of corporations here today that I know are participating in a, um, a trade program. You know, um, the, the big thing now is that everybody doesn't have to get a four-year degree. Everybody is not able to get a four-year degree. And um, I just jot it down um, just for the sake of the people that I could remember. Um, Aon is a part of the corporation, uh, part of the uh, program. ComEd is a part of the co program. Northern Trust, Kim Evans is here for mine. She's working. <laughs> I didn't plan that. I really didn't. You don't get it? I work for Northern Trust? <laughs> Slow crowd. Um, so Ka uh, Kim Evans is here and she's working with some of those people in our operations group. Um, some of these folks who are working on coding and things like that where they go to these nine, um, nine month programs or um, community programs, uh, Microsoft and um, Motorola are also some of the programs. So we are working to uh, employ folks. And you're right, as soon as they get a check, they are so happy um, because they feel like they're contributing. So um, again, you see the corporations uh, participating. Uh, let's move on. 
Okay, this one is for Superintendent Johnson again. Despite all of the positive trends you cited, why does Chicago have a per capita homicide rate six times the rate, oh, you've kind of talked about this before, um, of New York and four times the rate of LA? What have those cities done that's different than what we're doing in Chicago? I know you've talked about that, so just kind of glow. Okay, so real quickly, uh, that, we get compared to New York and LA so much because we're the biggest three cities in the country. Uh, but if you want to be factual about the per capita rate, Chicago isn't even close to the top of, of uh, murders per capita in the country. We're not. We're about in the middle of the pack. Uh, but we're not tone deaf either. But I think, uh, and, and she's right, a lot of corporations in this city are contributing to that program. So those of you that are not, I would highly suggest that you, you know, get in touch with us and, and we can uh, and, you know, try to figure that out. Because a lot of corporations do, so I don't want you all to think that nobody's doing that, but, but for those of you that are not. But I tell you what New York and LA are doing, just that. A lot of their um, corporate partners in those two cities are helping with that population of people that need something to do, and they drive those resources in that direction. So that's why they have seen um, a reduction. Plus, I tell you this that, that people don't talk about. Chicago and Illinois, we sit between Wisconsin and Indiana, who has very lax gun laws. So what our people do is go across the border and they'll fill up sacks full of guns and bring them back into the city and use them for the things that we see every day. New York and, and LA, they have real strong uh, gun laws. People think we have the strong, strongest gun laws in the country. Don't believe that, that's, that's not factual because we don't. They do, in New York, you commit a crime with a gun, three and a half years in prison, no ifs, ands, and buts about it. We don't do that here. So those are the, 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 the main drivers of why they are seeing uh, those reductions. LA has a, you use a gun, it's, a, it's enhanced by like five years, you shoot somebody, the penalty is enhanced by 10 years, you kill somebody, 15 years. We just simply don't do that here in Cook County. So those are the things that are helping them reduce the violence that we're not seeing here. We have an election coming up, everyone. <laughs> so um, Father Flager and Mary, I'm going to, um, Justice Lampkin and um, Stephanie Trussell, I'm going to combine your two questions for the sake of continuity. Um, in short, we see that officers are doing things. We kind of see that things that are going on with the communities. What can we do to merge the ecumenical um, programs with the community that we're not already doing? Do you have any ideas? I'm sure you do have ideas. Which programs? I'm sorry. Um, any of the ecumenical you know, ideas that you're doing in the church to be merged with the community um, to reduce, Stephanie's, the, the tail end of it is Stephanie's asked to reduce violence, but the, the, the larger question comes from um, Justice Lampkin. I'll let you two answer that. Go ahead, ladies first. <laughs> 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 I guess I want to get back to um, the subject of families and communities, okay? Yeah. So when we say what role the church can play, uh, I, I, first of all, I think everybody knows this, the church is doing a very poor job in most communities, very poor in terms of outreach. I know I have a difficulty with my own church, great building, wonderful uh, 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 families, uh, very supportive, but they don't have any children. So we get back to, you build it, you have a church, you have the resources, how do you get people to bring their kids to take advantage of those resources? That's a problem. We don't want to talk about it because it seems like victim shaming. But it's not victim shaming. We got to do a better job and expect people who have children to bring their children to the resources that are available to them. I mean, I, I, I took off a week of work just to do a vacation Bible school, and we had like five people from South Shore. How is that possible? How is it possible that you can't get people to get up and bring their kids out to things that is going to empower their lives and enrich their lives? We got to deal with that. And so church people got to come out of the church building to go into the neighborhood and actually do outreach knock on doors is that important we're in a crisis here yeah. if we can knock on doors and ask people to vote we can sure knock on doors and say hey can can you bring your kids we got something for them we got a dance class here we got a we got a basketball team we're putting together we got 
We have things for kids to do. Kids are getting in trouble and getting involved because they, they don't have any, they don't know. And it's not, kids can't get themselves up and get where they're to these uh, resources. The parent has to do it. So the question has to be how do we get more parents to take more responsibility to do this for their children? I want to say, well, some of y'all won't get that. <laughs> Man, a whole bunch of y'all didn't get it. Explain to the people. Just Father Flager. Respond to that. One is, first, let me clarify when I'm talking about corporations. I'm not talking about all corporations, obviously. Um, we work very closely with ComEd, who just this week got two more of our guys' jobs. Um, but under, under Trump, okay. yes, ComEd. <laughs> now, could you pay my bill? Uh, <laughs> um, um, under, under Trump, a lot of companies became very, very wealthy and made a lot of money. And I think some of that money should have been reinvested into the communities in our cities than just getting more money. Some of that money should come back in and reinvest it in communities that are most neglected. So, uh, and I think when companies come into this city and get big tax write-offs and tax incentives, Part of that incentive ought to be that in the 12 to 14 most unemployed neighborhoods, that they tire some people from those 12 to 14 neighborhoods so we equal the playing field in Chicago. But as far as the church thing, an ecumenical thing, religion's another gang. I mean, let's be real about it. Whether, whether it's different faiths or whether it's different denominations, they are gangs unto themselves. And it's very hard to tell brothers on the street that they need to come together and respect each other when churches don't respect each other. And they're, they're, they're fighting with each other or talking about in the pulpit about each other. So it's not a very good example that, that trickles down. But the churches, like Mary said, churches have to understand a philosophy that what makes you, for I'm a Christian, what makes you a Christian is not what you do in church. That's the huddle. That's right. What do you do when you get out of the huddle? That's right. What makes you a Christian and gives you authenticity is what you do in the neighborhood. Every, if every church in this city said they'd take four blocks north, south, and east, and west of them, and they would be responsible for that, we would need more police in our neighborhoods. Mm. If police could walk with mm. us instead of having to come into crime, if we just took responsibility. It's just the truth. The last thing, the last, the last thing is this, is that not only the churches have to be engaged, but they have to teach their members to be engaged where they live and the houses they live. And what Mary was talking about, building neighborhood again. We ought to be the nucleus of teaching our members who go back to homes and blocks and community how to rebuild community, rebuild family, rebuild neighborhoods, and create that feeling again. I don't look for government to build community. I don't look for corporate to build community, but we ought to be doing that. And I think since the church doesn't see its, its, its um, identity as that, we're not teaching our members to do that. It's true. Let me respond to Thank you, that. Father that question about church in the community real quick. So when I was the commander of the 6th district, um, I had a particular corner in that district that was probably the top three of gun violence that particular year. And I'll never forget this. I was at a, um, a black church. I'm not going to say which one. And I begged this, this reverend to come out with me and let's go to that corner. And then after we do it that first time, can you and your congregation kind of take over that corner on Friday and Saturday nights? And, this, and he was like, uh, I can't do that. And, and so now I'm at my wit's end because I, I know I have to drive that crime down on that particular corner. So guess where I went? Right down here to, to Father Mike. And I just explained to him what was going on. That was close to his church, but he's right. Reverends are gangsters, man. They're, they're very <laughs> territorial. And boy, you get in trouble with them quick. Go ahead. Oh, God. <laughs> At any rate, I went to him and uh, explained the situation. And I will tell you this. That summer, every Friday night, he would come out there with about 200 people from his church and just take over that, that particular area. Mm -hmm. We had no shootings over there, none, none for the rest of that summer. Now, when I ran back into that other reverend, uh, he was a little feeling a certain kind of way with me. <laughs> he was, and he said, why did you go to Father Mike to ask about that? I said, well, I asked you first and you refused. So then he said, yeah, but, and I said, but what? And he said, well, but he's white. And I said, who? <laughs> And he said, Father Flager. And I looked at him and I said, Father Flager is white? 
I said, well, I can't tell it by what he's doing out there in that corner, because color doesn't matter when it comes to getting gun violence done. <laughs> See, Father, I told you. <laughs> Um, oh, my Lord. Call a neighbor, call a friend, look to your neighbor left, right. Churches, we got some work to do. So the question says, Jay, you'll get a kick out of this, that it's from Bruce Rauner. <laughs> and it says he's not a member of the City Club. <laughs> so who, Bruce, whoever you're, you know, whoever you're impersonating the governor, I'm going to ask your question. Which mayoral candidate is most prepared to deal with the violence in Chicago? And I think that it's a broad question, but I would like to direct it to Mary. Ooh, no. <laughs> Remember, you're just a citizen. Okay. That's why I'm asking her, right, exactly. So as a citizen, I would say this. That is the question that needs to be put to every candidate and every person who's running for office. Okay. They need to be able to judge their plans. They need to have a plan. That's first of all. They need to have a plan. And they need to be able to address exactly how they intend to uh, uh, proceed if they are elected. I think very often we ask questions about policy, but we don't, and we let candidates get off. And I'm on the editorial board, so I can say this. We let candidates get off with these very vague answers. But right now, they need specifics. They need to be able to say how are they going to get corporations to uh, invest in community. I need to understand, and uh, as a citizen, why we have all these corner stores in our neighborhood and nobody uh, they're working in the store looks like us. Right. Why, why does that happen and who has allowed that to happen? So you, you, we need to be able to put our questions to the candidate, ask them to specifically address the gun issue, the uh, corporate investment issue, the, how, it, how they plan to change the perception that crime is uh, uh, so outrageous in Chicago more so than any other city. Because yes, whenever I read that Chicago is number four or number five when it comes to crime, I'm shocked by that. If you read the news or you, you, you listen to the talk shows, you think we are the murder capital of the country. So I think you just have to be very, you, you got to hold their feet to the fire and you have to be very, very uh, uh, diligent and trying to get answers about how they intend to address the crime. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Father or superintendent, would you care to chime in on that? <laughs> They're like, no. Yes. No, not at all. I'm in a no. uh, <laughs> precarious situation here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'll just say this, that crime has to be a priority. Right. And to Mary's point, you know, it, it, it's, it's, crime is not just about the police. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a, it, you have to have a, a, a collaborative effort and a, a holistic plan to drive down crime. We can put 100,000 cops out there, but if we, don't, if we don't address the root causes of what causes it, then we'll still be spinning our wheels. You know? yeah. So that person has to know that. I, I disagree with both Mary and, and the soup. I think um, we've got to demand that our candidates running, all 50 of them, um, <laughs> <laughs> we need some real answers. We need some real concrete answers, no abstract, no general thing. I mean, I, I'm so tired of just talking about, yes, I want to handle the crime issue. How? What are your plans? What are your concrete plans? How are you going to do this? And anybody that does not come out with concrete plans for education, for the, for the economic development, and for the, and for the crime and the violence doesn't deserve to run. Wow. Um, I, I agree. My mom is from Missouri. You have to show me. So. They need to tell us what they're talking about. That's just the truth. This next question is from Lauren Tucker, Indivisible Chicago, and she is a City Club member. Um, I, I'll read the question and I'll let you guys figure out. Have there been efforts where average work-a-day police officers and citizens work together to build solutions for better relations between the police engagements in their neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question. So, you know, when I became superintendent, l listen, I've been a cop for 30 years now, and I've lived in Chicago my entire life. I've raised my family here. So I am acutely aware of the relationship with, with the minority communities and the police department. That, that doesn't escape me. So to that end, we are working really hard. The day one that I sat in this chair, uh, we started working on repairing and rebuilding fractured relationships. And I, and I just got to put this out there. You know, it just pains me when I hear people say the black community does not want police in their community. That's not true. Mm -hmm. They just want the police to be fair and treat them with respect. Right. That's what they want. And they deserve right. that. 
you know, so to that end, remember when all of us grew up, we had the officer friendly program and things of that nature that was, for whatever reason, was abandoned. Well, we have brought it back now. Our community policing officers, remember in the 90s, Chicago was a model for the country in terms of community policing. And then we went off the rails. Mm -hmm. We're not going to worry about how that happened. What we're going to worry about is today and how we make that better. So now I put the community policing office under the office of the superintendent. And what that essentially did was change community policing from a strategy to a department-wide philosophy. So now every cop in the CPD has to engage in some kind of community policing. So we're getting the cops out of the cars. We're having uh, programs, basketball games, softball games, chess matches between police officers and high school okay. kids. Those are the things we need to continue and expand on and scale it up to make that relationship better. Okay, I can keep going. Uh, this is a question um, from someone who is a, um, a psychologist. Um, and, and again, anyone can answer. What can we do to reduce the n number and the effect on the innocent bystanders who are shot in our communities? That's a tough question. The super probably better answer this to me, but I think we're living in a, in a day of cowards. You know, when I lived in the West Side and back in the early 70s, if I'm mad at Mary and I want to get Mary, I'm going to come up and get Mary. And I'm going to make sure she sees me while I'm beating her. <laughs> <laughs> My name is not Judge Kavanaugh. I want to. <laughs> I'm surprised you all are here, really. And I, I, but, but we don't live in that day anymore. We live in a day of cowards. So now, people just spray bullets. They don't, they're not after a target anymore. They're after people. They're after a group. If you live one side of Ashton, or you live over at 83rd Street, so they're just sprayed. So they don't care who they shoot or who they kill. It's a day of cowards. And it's a day when you used to come up and you use your fist, when you take a gun and spray on a porch or spray in a house or spray in a playground, you are a coward and a punk. Yeah. And we've got to begin to identify them as that and name them as that. Right. And then we've got to be able to say we're going to get them out of our neighborhoods. By In our neighborhood, we're going to make sure that you understand. And it's people coming forward, whether it's a code of silence in the police department or code of silence on the street. When five or six people come by and say, he did it, then nobody's a target. When we just allow one person, then they're afraid and they're, they feel like they're a target. But if everybody speaks, if that becomes the norm rather than the exception, we no longer have targets. And I think we create communities that speak up. Yeah. Ms. Mitchell? And, and I also think that uh, one, of the, one of the problems the city is facing is the fact that if you say that this violence and this, um, this gun violence is a priority, we are survivors of this gun violence. It has affected, it's affected me personally, it's affected people in the community. Think about the loss, just the loss of lives and what that means, that people are grieving. They're losing their, they've lost a daughter, they lost a son or a cousin. Where's the mental health facilities to deal with that? Where's the, where's the treatment? In every school and in, in every neighborhood that's impacted by the violence, they should have access to mental health treatment so that they can That's deal right. with the aftermath of the violence. Right. And if we don't do that, and when we don't do that, we're saying that it's not important. We think we're people just going to get up and have a normal life now that they've lost their daughter, or they lost yeah. their son? Yeah. So I'll respond. That's right. That's right. I'll respond to that really quickly. So I'll tell you all a real short story. So one day, uh, myself and uh, my partner were out on the west side. And we were over by the Harrison Court's apartment complex, or public housing uh, complex. And there were about five shots. I was watching these little kids on the playground just playing, seven, eight, nine years old. They were just out there playing, doing what kids do. And there were about four or five gunshots that went off. And it was right there where we were. So I see these kids jump down on the ground. So uh, me and my partner, we go around the corner. We could still see the smoke, but the shooter was gone. Nobody was hit. That's not the point. We drive back around to the playground, and these little kids jump right back up playing. So what that said to me is we're allowing our kids to be normalized right. with this crap. Yeah. That's right. not normal for little kids to see that and grow up like that. Now, think about this. They're seven to eight years old. They keep seeing that. 
they're traumatized. Yeah. Now, when they become 16 and 17 years old, how do they deal with conflict? They, they go, go get, get a gun. gun. They get a right. gun. That's what they do. They right. go get a gun. So we have to be very mindful that this is trauma. Right. And we have to address that. I went to uh, the Children's Museum yesterday just by happenstance. And I saw a large um, stage presence for um, the fire department. So I went to the Children's Museum and I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Where, where, whoa, where's CPD stuff? Because the point is this, we have to introduce kids to what the police do at an early age so they don't fear the police and look at the police as the enemy. That's they have to be comfortable with, with being able to talk to the police, but at the same time, if they have trauma going on in their lives, to Mary's point, we have to put these people in these schools at early ages to be able to identify it and to treat these kids before they become right. part of the problem. Right. Right. No, kids cannot be what they cannot see. I'll say it and say it again. Um, do we have any healthcare professionals in the house today, outside of the philanthropic folks? Okay, so we've got a few here. Um, mental health is a real deal. You know, we've got heart doctors, we've got dentists, we also you know, need psychologists and things like that. I get, it. I get credit for that shout out, don't I? I like that. Um, okay, so this is gonna be the last formal question, then I want to give each one of the panelists time to do a wrap-up statement. Um, this is from a Dwayne Deskins, are you here? Oh, cool. Hi. Uh, in your conversations with, I'm assuming this is going to be, well, I don't know who this is to, I'll just read it. In your conversations with gang-involved violent persons, what do you think would have made a difference in their lives? Anyone? Or all, I don't. Could you repeat it again? Sam? Yes. In your conversations with gang-involved or violent persons, what do you think would have made a difference in their lives? Oh, that's, let, let me tell you all this. So I was talking to a group of, I think they were like <coughs> 15 to 17 year olds. It was about 30 of them, maybe 25 males and uh, five females, black and Hispanics. And we were just having a candid conversation. And in this group of 30 kids, all of them had either shot somebody or tried to shoot somebody. Mm. Every one of them, How males old? and females, between 15 and 17 years old. Now for those kids to admit that to the police superintendent yeah. was huge. But I would tell you this, so after we talked as a group, I talked to each one of them individually. And I asked them this one simple question. Every one of them, the reason I did it individually, because I didn't want one answer to influence the next person. Every one of those kids told me what changed their lives it was police officers, it was clergy, people, complete strangers. Tapped them on the shoulder and said, hey, I care about what you're doing and the direction that you're going in. And they told each one of those kids, I'm gonna try to set you on the right path. Each one of them. And that changed their lives. That's why when people ask me about crime, the mayor and I have a really good relationship. He's never told me no when I said to him, I need resources for this. One of the biggest things he did, people think, the best thing he did for me was agreeing to the police academy with a thousand more officers. That's not it. The biggest things he did for me was when he created those 32,000 summer jobs and that mentorship program with like seven or 8,000 young black men are in that mentorship program. That's huge because that gives those kids hope and it, and it lets them see what life can be. So that's what we need to do to change this thing around. Mary, your father, do you have a comment on that one before we do final comments? Um, how many of us in the crowd, this is a sellout audience, we had a, quite a waiting list. How many of us, just by show of hands, know of someone who has either been a victim of crime or has pulled the trigger? Wow. That's an amazing number. And then outside of that, how many of us have actually taken that young man or young woman, I'm assuming they're young man or young woman, aside and had a conversation with them? So I can't put it all in the churches this time. I said churches, we have some work to do. It looks like those of us who are in the room have some work to do as well. Do we agree? Yes. 
yeah, so again, in the church, the preachers say, look to your left, to your right, and talk to somebody. Um, just saying. Uh, I'm going to start with closing comments, and I'm actually going to go in the reverse order this time. Father, would you give us your closing thoughts? Um, we will. This is part two. Um, Jay, we're having a part three? We're, we're having quit in five minutes. No, are we having a part three next year? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, Jay. <laughs> Uh, quickly, Father? first about the, the, uh, the young men and the, the, the connection with gangs. Let me say four things I think they need is love, respect, opportunity, and an adult in their life who leg legitimately cares about them and also puts discipline and structure in their life. The last thing I want to end up with is this. This violence thing, we have to understand this is winnable. Mm -hmm. This is not something we have to deal with, get accustomed to, get normalized to, but it's going to take all of us. It's going to take mothers and fathers, it's going to take young people, it's going to take law enforcement, business and corporate, it's going to take churches and synagogues and mosques, it's going to take all of us in this room. I just invite everybody here to find some place where you can mentor somebody. You know, maybe you can only do an hour a week, maybe it's just a phone call once or twice a week, but we all got to put our hands, roll our sleeves up and get involved in this. We can turn, this is a great city, we got great people, and the south and the west sides are full of potential and possibility, but we've got to turn it around together. Citizen Mitchell. <laughs> so, I guess I would leave you with this. You know, young people need love. They need the respect. They need guidance. They need to know that people care. I run into a lot of young people and believe me, when I walk in that room and they're all hostile and they don't, you think that they don't want to hear what you have to say and they don't want to listen, but when you really take your time and speak to them, they want better things. They want a good life too. They want a safe neighborhood. They want to live in a community that's crime free. They want to live in a community that's clean and that's decent, just like every other kid. And so I see a Chicago with a vital city where people are working together to change the perception that it's bad on the west side or it's bad on the south side or these are neighborhoods, these are neighborhoods that are without hope. We can't let that happen. In our city, we have, the, and I, it's not, not going to be a savior in the, in the mayoral race, believe me. The mayor can't save us on this one. It has to be something that we all come together and want to do together. Remembering that it's, the children are our future. Without them, without those kids on the west side, without those kids on the south side, we have no future in this city. That's right, Mary. That's what we have to go for. That's what we have to remember. So I guess I'm the closer today. So <laughs> this is what I would say to you all. I can, I can sit up here and you all hear me talking about crime all the time. I can tell you we're down 20% in murders, 19% in overall shootings, but those are just numbers. But remember this, when I talk about those numbers, those are people right. that we're talking about, people. And each one of those persons represents a family that's being traumatized by this gun violence. Here's, here's the, the, at the end of the day, this is what you need to remember. We are better than this as a city. We're right. better than this. And to Father Mike's point, we can win this. See, I sit in a unique position where I see us turning the corner. I see us turning the corner, but people don't feel 20% safer. They just don't. It's the perception of what's going on out here. So I urge, urge and encourage everybody sitting in this audience today, ask yourselves what can you and your organization do to get in the fight? Because at the end of the day, you can't talk about change and what ifs. You have to be willing to be part of it. Right. So we all have to be part of making Chicago better and erase that narrative that our city is on fire because it, it is simply not. This is a great beautiful, wonderful city, and we have great, beautiful, and wonderful people that live in this city. So let's do it together. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you all. Jackie's going to make the presentation, but I want to, Jackie is right. There should be a part three. First of all, I want to thank everyone here. But I think today we saw a lot of 
positive energy and a lot of positive suggestions to you in the business and charitable civic community and uh, the, the church, the neighborhood, the family, the whole bit. So thank you for supporting the City Club of Chicago and let's give yourselves a round of applause and then uh, Jackie, go ahead. But you're right, round three. Okay.